Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by Loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou. We're a little bit late this week, unfortunately. Um, I'll take the blame for that. It's my fault. Uh, Releasing on Wednesday instead of Tuesday, simply because I couldn't be asked uh, when I got home on Monday night. That's the truth. Um, Joining me on the line is my Sofa Sports podcast podcast. Uh, partner in crime, co-host, whatever you want to call him, is Dan DeLuca. Dan, welcome. How you doing, mate? Hi, Ari. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome anytime. And and there is a special reason I've got you on tonight. Um, usually, I don't really like talking to Spurs fans, especially not on here. Uh, but tonight sees the start of a new feature, which is called A Trip Down Memory Lane, where we'll be discussing historical games from the past. Um, I don't know how historical this one is, because we beat Spurs a lot of times, so... You know, it's nothing really that amazing. But um, we put a vote out during the week. We wanted to know what games you wanted us to look back on. And given the North London derby is around the corner, we thought it would only be right to do uh, one of those games. We've picked the Arsenal 5 Spurs 2 from the 26th of February 2012. And and Dan's going to chip in uh, with the Spurs point of view. So uh, expect uh, plenty of coating off of Arsenal. Uh, Not that I condone it, but... Yeah, that's what he's here to do. Uh, let's quickly run through the two teams. Uh, Arsenal went with Wojciech Szczesny in goal. Bakary Sanya right back. Koscielny, Vermeilen and Gibbs made up the rest of the defence. A midfield of Alex Song and Mikel Arteta with Theo Walcott, Thomas Rizitski, Yossi Benayoun and Robin Van Persie leading the line. Spurs started with a 4-4-2, it says here. I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate i'm sure dan will be able to shed some light on that but it was friedel walker kabul king asua koto the dj man uh nico cranshaw harry redknapp's mate scott parker luka modric gareth bale emmanuel Aguayo, and louis saha um dan let's start off uh from the very beginning spurs took a 2-0 lead didn't they uh louis saha got the first goal i'll be honest i didn't even remember that he played for uh for spurs until i, I looked this up again no, well, this was, if you remember, this was the time Harry Redknapp was just starting. He was just going to court for his tax evasion and um, where we put putting money in his dog's bank account. And um, he, he said that he didn't write his tax forms because he couldn't spell. And in January, we were linked with Kakar. And I'm convinced <laughs> that he spelt it wrong. He spelt it wrong. And then we ended up with with Saha. And then we, we got Ryan Nelson thrown into the bargain as well. But that is that is a spelling error. That was meant to be Kakar, and and this would be a totally different, a totally different result. There's no doubt about that. I don't think Kakar would have been interested in in joining uh, North London's second club, would he? Let's be uh, honest, po- po- poss- poss- possibly not. Possibly yeah. not. Oh, there you go. So the game started off. Um, obviously, Spurs took the lead. Adebayor's through ball completely split that Arsenal defence, which was basically non-existent, if I'm being honest. Um, and then Saha cut inside onto his left foot, didn't he? And his shot just uh, deflected off of a mile and, and rather fortuitously went over Wojciech Szczesny. Um You must have been in dreamland when that went in. Yeah, I think um, I think it's probably worth just touching on the build-up to this game in particular because for me, this was this is the first season that I would say that Spurs were as good, if not better, than Arsenal. Do me a favour. Over the course, <laughs> this is the first. This was the first season for me. So, so, and this was the first season where we were challenging to to achieve Champions League football, whereby I felt we were good enough. So we had a good run with Arsenal in two thousand and six, where we ultimately fell short on the last day, didn't we? But but I don't think Spurs were good enough then. I think we were just you know hanging on to Arsenal's coattails throughout the season. In, in two thousand and ten, we we made the Champions League, but, but we had a bit of a poor season, and we did well. But this was the first season where actually we, we were actually developing into a good side. And it's kind of the start of where Spurs are today in a way, although we've had some setbacks. But <clears throat> going into this game, um, we were seven points ahead and Arsenal were just in a bit of bad form. Um, we'd won at Emirates the previous season, which was our first way win at Arsenal for a good yeah. few years. So confidence was really, really high going into the game. We felt, you know, we were... As good, if not a better football inside Arsenal. We've just been form. thumped, haven't we, by AC Milan in the Champions League four 0 So 
You must yeah, that's right. And your chances. Yeah, you just lost to Sunderland as well. But I mean, I know, I know, I know better than you know when it comes to when it comes to derbies. You know, the form form needs to be ignored in most cases, especially when there's a certain team at home. But we're going into it full of confidence, and we've taken a lead after four minutes, which, which as you say, was a very fortuitous goal. But yeah, I, rem- I remember watching the game. Um, Obviously, in anticipation, it was one of the biggest North London derbies for, for some time at that point. And, um, yeah, it was a remarkable start for us, for sure. Yeah, I mean, l- looking at the, the teams which I've already touched on, I mean, Arsenal's defence w- was not too bad. Sanya, Koscielny, Vermeilen. We were having a debate on the same old Arsenal last night about whether he uh, was better than Per Mertesacker. I don't personally think so. Um, I don't Who, Vermeilen? Yeah, I don't think he was as good a defender. It would be interesting to get your take from a neutral point of view. Um, I thought he was re- I thought he was a really good defender. I thought, I thought he was a really good player, more so. Um, but I think he had defensive lapses in him. And I think if you you remember, obviously, but his first season, he his goal scoring exploits were ridiculous. Right. Yeah. Um, he was scoring goals with his head, his feet. He was popping up in the box, and I think that that can mask things a little bit. So it happens a lot in the modern model, particularly with fullbacks where you think someone's a really good fullback because they pop up in the opposition box a lot, when the fundamentals have to be you've got to be able to defend. Um, I thought he was a good defender. Um, He went to Barcelona where, you know, Barcelona, historically, with the exception of Puyol possibly, but they have got a habit of getting defenders over there who don't necessarily need to defend but are better at ball playing. So I think he was more suited to Spain, albeit it never worked out for him injury-wise. But there was a period of time where he was he was probably one of the first names on your team sheet. So I don't think he was a bad player, but um, I think he, he didn't quite have the discipline of of a top-level centre-half. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And that, that's what I was saying yesterday. I, I felt that his goal-scoring exploits masked the fact that he couldn't defend half the time. And that's just, you know, a lot of people would disagree with me, but that's just how I feel on that particular player. Uh, that's um, how the cookie crumbles sometimes. That's right, that's right. But looking at Spurs' team, a midfield of Cranshaw, who, you know, was a, a fairly decent player back then. Um, Scott Parker, you knew you were going to get hard work out of him. Uh, Luka Modric, who has gone on to become one of the world's best central midfield players, if not the best. And then, obviously, Gareth Bale. I mean, that was quite a formidable midfield for Spurs, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it, it was. And... Um... This, this season here, where I said earlier this was the first time actually I felt we were a good side and we, we were competing on merit and it has, has been the base, the base of, of, of almost where we are today, is that side I learned how to, how to play as a team as opposed to in the past where we had some terrible players and one or two good individuals. On paper, uh, there's still some poor individual players on that lineup that you've you, you read out there. But we had a terrible start to the season Luka Modric, who you touched on, has gone on to bigger and better things. But this was the year where we, we fended off bids from other clubs. And um, the first two games, he, he didn't start one. had a sulk in the second one and got subbed off. But yeah. we, went, we went on a run um, after the first two games where we won, I think we won 10 of 11 games or we won nine out of 10 games and drew the other with six wins in a row, which I think was our, our Premier League record at that time. Um, so we really worked out how to play the team. I think Scott Parker was was pivotal to that because he did the he did the only work in the middle, allowed Luka Modric a space to ping the ball, and obviously with Gareth Bale and the pace he had at that particular time, um, Adebayor had a really good season as well, scoring goals. So everything sort of come together for us in that season. So for us, we we felt even though Arsenal had, if you listed the individuals on a piece of paper, you'd have probably had three Arsenal players in the top five and two Spurs players. But we did feel going into that game that midfield would be where we where we could for once win the battle. And the first five or ten minutes of the game, from pretty much from kickoff, Spurs were passing the ball around in a really composed fashion away from home. Yeah. Um and whilst the goal was, was lucky, there was nothing at that point really to to be anything but completely happy with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And from an Arsenal point of view, I mean I'll be honest, I was shitting my pants. There's nothing worse than losing at home to your North London rivals, and then the, the, the sort of the terror got worse when Gareth. Bale You've only seen it through. once. You've only seen it once in your lifetime, I'd true, say. True. Maybe twice. True. true. That is true, and I do feel sorry for you lot. To be honest, no, I don't really. Um, but obviously, that 
that fear got worse when Gareth Bale raced through um, and was, was down and Spurs got a penalty and ended up going 2-0 up. Emmanuel Adebayor from the spot. Now, um, I, I remember feeling that day a bit like I was equally, I was disappointed that we just conceded, but I was also equally as pissed off that it was Emmanuel Adebayor, um, given that he used to play for us and the way he left and, and things like that. But, you know, Adebayor was, was a pretty decent forward. You've got to say, uh, I don't know what you think. I think, yeah, I was looking at it like last night. He's got almost a one, one two goal ratio for Arsenal for his, during his time at Arsenal. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and he's a player who probably gets a lot more stick than he deserves. Um, I think, like, by the end, we absolutely hated him. That season, he joined He joined for us on, on deadline day or the day before deadline day, scored on his debut against Wolves, which was the third game of our season. And we got three points, having lost 3-0 or 5-1 in our first two games. Um, but we were, we were desperate for a striker. And when he joined, we were quite happy because he had been scoring goals. I didn't think he had the best start at Arsenal when he initially joined. I thought he's a very unorthodox player. Yeah, but, definitely. But... Um, the, the guy knew where the goal was. I mean, he, when he played for Arsenal, he scored against Spurs every time. It was like Robert Perez. You, you knew he'd score. And one, at least one of them at Wild Lane was at the game. Um, you can imagine. It was an absolutely ridiculous goal. The one where he flicked it um, around the corner and smashed it from outside the box. I remember that. Ping. We, we were the best side on that day as well. It was just so demoralising to see that fly in. Um, Quality comes and through. Think, Quality comes through, think, doesn't it? I think Denilson, Denilson hit an absolute worldie in that game as well. But we're not talking about that um, but yeah, I remember this game here, uh, Arsenal, the first 15, 20 minutes or so, Spurs were Spurs were pretty much comfortable in, and in command. And then Arsenal gradually started to take over lots of possession, Spurs on the back foot. And it was starting to, you know, you're starting to get a little bit jittery and thinking we're losing control of the football match a little bit earlier than you'd like. And then um, it was on the break where the penalty was won. And if I'm, if I'm honest, I, I thought it was a bit of a dive. Um, I thought it was, you know, it was a clearly played for penalty. There was yeah. there was a sort of a sandwich between them. The defender, I can't remember who it was, if I'm honest. I've not seen Gibbs. the games. I think it was Kieran Gibbs and Is it uh, Gibbs? Chesney, yeah. Yeah, Chesney was was prone to go walkabouts anyway during his time at Arsenal <laughs> and, and just didn't make the, the best decision. And it was all too easy for Gareth Bale to just get to the ball first. Of course he will. Um, and win the penalty that way. But it was a penalty where he played for it. And... Um, you know, to say to dive is perhaps a little bit pushing it, but it, you know he knew exactly what he was doing, and there was never any chance that a goal was going to be scored. It was get to the ball first, and, and we'll take the penalty. Yeah. And um, at that point, two 0 was a massive relief because, like I say, I remember, I remember vivid, I remember the game vividly. I've, I've not even seen it since, if I'm honest. Um, but I remember I don't vividly blame you, to be at, at that point, um, just just seeing the game and Arsenal starting to take over, obviously away from home. They get against, you know, this was still a good side. It wasn't the best Arsenal side of that decade by any means. But to then go 2 0 up um, within 10, well, 10 minutes to half time ish, you know, you're feeling in really good shape. Yeah. And at that point, you've just got to get to half time, you feel, and um, the rest will be history. That's right. And and Arsenal, as you said, they, they managed to nick a goal five minutes before half time, actually. The most unlikely of goal scorers as well, Bakary Sanya. Um, Arteta with a left-footed cross. He just sort of floated it into the box and Sanya just seemed to arrive late. Um, nobody picked him up and he managed to guide his head into the... his header, sorry, into the far corner. But, and but why was he there? I, I still won't understand. What, what was he doing there? Because, <clears throat> like we said before, that was like the Marlon that popped up there. Um, I remember the goal, it came from... It, it, there was a set play. The ball was half cleared. It ended up at, at Van Persie's feet and he, he's hit a, a trademark... Um, you know, twenty yard rasp, but has hit the outside of the post and um, travelled wide, and you, you kind of think the damage is done. The, the, the damage is over at that point, and it's fallen into the path of an Arsenal player a couple of passes, and then it crossed back into Sagna. So I think Sagna might have stayed up possibly, but yeah, it's just um, it's a really unlikely. You know, I I can't recall or imagine he scored um, many other headers from the middle of the box for no, Arsenal. I, I, I can only remember two or three yeah. Bakary Sagna goals for Arsenal, to be honest. Um, but yeah, back in the game, five minutes to go till half time, and then Robin Van Persie had another one of those shots that you spoke about, another trademark effort, made a bit of space for himself onto that wand of a left foot of his and found the far corner. Friedel, absolutely no chance. Brilliant goal, 2-2, half time. 
And uh, I think there's a lot of pa- there's a lot of power in it as well. He didn't quite find the corner, but <clears throat> I think this game obviously we're going to come on to the second half in a minute and maybe talk a bit of the tactics. But this is a game where, in terms of in terms of timing, everything everything's gone right for Spurs at getting an early goal. And then getting a second goal before off time when we were starting to lose a bit of control of the midfield, everything's perfect. And then for Arsenal to pop up with the two goals the way they did just before half time, change your complexion completely. Because the half time team talk, the half time tactics, and everything went out of the window. And then furthermore, you're still sitting there at half time thinking, well, do you know what? Actually, we're in this game. We've still got players who can hurt Arsenal. We're still playing well enough. And you know, this game could be anybody's at this point. And then Arsenal scored within five minutes of the restart as well. And that was the moment really where where the game was done. I think during that period, I, you will know because you we speak a lot, I wasn't a massive fan of Harry Redknapp as, as, as a football manager yeah. tactically. and He frustrated me a lot. But what Harry Redknapp did at Tottenham, I managed to be doing it for, for decades, but Harry Redknapp at Tottenham was, was the pinnacle of this is what we'll do. What we'll do is we'll, um, we'll get a goal and we'll play on the counter-attack. And that's fine, but you can't counterattack when the ball is in your own net. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that, at that point, you have to pick it up and walk to the centre circle. And that, that's, that I feel, was, was Harry Redknapp's downfall. Um, possibly even even in, even in this game, I, I, do, I do feel like just sitting there getting a goal and hoping to counterattack is great. Um, but you're inviting a team to attack and it's a risky strategy. And sometimes you have to weigh up what risk is bigger. Um, this isn't a Tottenham show, but... The, the game, the game that ultimately cost us our Champions League position in this in this season, was a game before the end of the season against Aston Villa, where it, it finished fourth, but obviously Chelsea won the Champions League and Arsenal finished third by that point. Okay. So, or on the last day, but basically it was against Aston Villa and they were down to ten men. And instead of throwing the kitchen sink at Aston Villa in the last twenty five minutes, he didn't. So he essentially gambled that Chelsea would lose the Champions League final. And he decided that was more likely than Emil Heskey scoring for Aston Villa. <clears throat> Just really poor decisions. But yeah, yeah the goal, the Van Persie goal, it, it was a lot of it was all about power. He didn't quite find the corner. To, no, to be honest, to be honest, watching it back today, you know, he he sets it out wide, and it it's not that powerful by Van Persie's standards. It just seems to bend. It whips away outside. from the keeper, doesn't yeah, it? That's it, right. It sort of curls away from Brad Friedel. I think Brad Friedel was about 64 years old during that game as well. So yeah, probably. His, his, his reflexes aren't going to be tipped up. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think many goalkeepers would have saved that. Um, but then, yep, half time came and six minutes after the break, Thomas Rosicki popped up. Now, he actually started this move, interestingly. Um, he waited for Bakary Sanya to come up on the overlap. He just played it into his path. But like you said, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what Spurs were doing there because... Having watched it back again today, you know, it just seems like Arsenal got so much room and to let Arsenal break and, and have so much space is just suicide, um, particularly with the quality that we had up top at that point. Um, and then Sanya puts the low cross in, Rosicki pops up at the near post and just sort of lifts it over the goalkeeper um, or just nicks in before him actually and just gets it into that near post. Yeah, we just beat Lady King at the near post, didn't we? And he, he managed to... Yeah. Yeah. Just get under the ball and nick and, and, and nick it and apply the finish. That's and, it. Um, Classic Thomas that Rosicki, that is, arriving late in the box and, you know, with explosive pace. And it's a real shame that he had so many injury problems at Arsenal because he was a really good player, loved by the fans, um, had a great relationship with us as supporters. And it's a real shame that he didn't get to play more football for Arsenal. Too yeah, he, was, he was a very good player and he's a, he's a likeable player as well. Actually. He's a very, cl- very clever footballer. You know, there's some footballers that you don't like um, for whatever reason, he's not one of them. Yeah, like no, you, agreed. like so, like Delhi Delhi Ali, for example, is a player you could quite easily understand why rival fans don't like him. Oh yeah, but have you seen that video of him it, today as well? Have you seen that no. video of him? There's a video of him and Ross Barkley pissed out of their heads in a hotel after the England game, arguing with staff and causing them grief. And some guys uh, videoed it and he's put it on the internet and it's gone viral. So uh, have a look out for that, and you'll see exactly well, why we don't. Uh, like him, yeah. uh, uh, I will do, but it's, it's understandable that he's the sort of player that a rival fan wouldn't like. When rival fans don't like Harry Kane, I, I don't understand that because he, he's a pretty inoffensive human being. It's not that we don't being. like him, we just don't understand what he's saying half the time. He, he looks like he's going to lick the we'll put a sub- or something. We'll put the subtitles on. 
<laughs> I don't even the think the subtitles have caught up yet. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Genuinely, I, I, I can't understand him when he speaks. I really can't. Um, right, just conscious of time. Let's move on to the fourth goal. Um, and this was the nail in the coffin for Spurs, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Theo Walcott. Now, interestingly, Van Persie gets the ball. I think Arsenal have tried to break here. Van Persie holds the ball up. He's got two defenders on him. And he's managed to to just hold it off, hold off the challenge from uh, just having a look at it now. I think it's Cabal is one of them. Uh, not sure who the other one is. And then Van Persie just plays it across. Walcott takes a, a bit of a bad touch, as you'd expect from Theo Walcott. But the finish, the, the little dink over Brad Friedel, I mean... I sit behind that goal and I must admit when I saw Walcott receive the ball and it sort of hit off his knee first and took him a little wider than he probably would have liked. I thought, here we go again. Typical Theo Walcott. He's going to mess this right up. Um, at that point, did you feel the game was over or did you feel it at 3-2? Um, no, I felt it at that point. I mean, at 3-2, when you've thrown away a two-goal lead, it's, you know, it's hard to be that positive. But, you know, you still know that we've got players on the pitch who are capable of scoring goals. Yeah. But when that goal goes in, and, and bear in mind when the next goal went in as well, you just feel, you know, we've seen Arsenal do this for, 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 for decades. You know, when Arsenal get their tails up and they start attacking at pace, um, you you know you're in a bit of trouble. And obviously you've got to remember at this point, and I don't want to give any of your, your followers any more, reason to, to, to self-indulge because Arsenal fans, you know, they take any opportunity to do that anyway. But, Here we but go. as a Spurs fan, you know, we've seen this before. We've led Arsenal before. During the, the run where, you know, there was a time when Arsenal were, you know, on a different planet to Tottenham. Even in those times, the amount of those games that we led, um, some we deserved to win and didn't get points. Some we deserved to draw and didn't get points. You know, we'd seen this all before. So at the point, at the point we've gone from 2-0 up uh, and suddenly we're four two down. Obviously, you know you get that you get that air of resignation as a fan that says, you know, here we go again. And mm. So <clears throat> at that point, that is that is a nail in the coffin in that football match. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you, you got to remember, like, so Theo Walcott is not a player um, that I rated particularly highly. Um, he might be slightly underrated overall uh, across his career, but yeah. he had a lot. He had a lot of, of faults, and I think he he got a lot of um, he got a lot of a. Uh, extra treatment when he was 16 <laughs> he didn't deserve and it stuck with him but when uh, when Spurs played Arsenal he was the player that, that frightened me it wasn't because he was a good player but he had the attributes to to hurt us and our left back position at that time was was weak yeah, um, um, and it happened in games in, in, in the future involving the same the same player and that was an area that I felt we should have been we should have been weary of. Yeah. Um, I remember the, the next season, it was identical. Like it wasn't an identical game because again, I mean, we took the lead, then we had a player sent off and we ended up being five, two and whatever, yeah. but all the goals came down that left side again. Um, and it was clear. It was a clear tactic of Arsenal to exploit that area, especially when it wasn't us counterattacking anymore. It, you know, Arsenal had the luxury to pick their attacks when they wanted yeah. any space, get are it in front of. Are Walcott. you suggesting that, Arsene Wenger had tactics. <laughs> um, I, I think I think you know he had some he had some tactics once upon a time, and I even even at the end, you know, I think he he knew what he set out to do. Um, but it's like you know, it's it's a long spi- it's a longer spiral. You know, when, when you start losing games and it, it, it becomes a habit, and you start getting self doubts, and and I think yeah. that's that's part of what happened to Tottenham on that, that particular day, and and in the subsequent games in that season. Yeah, absolutely. And then, like you said, a few minutes later, Theo Walcott popped up again. This time he finished low into the bottom corner. Two brilliant finishes, it's got to be said. And I always felt Theo Walcott was a lot more uh, clinical when he didn't have time to think about it. When the ball come, he took a touch, get it out of his feet, and he'll just hit it. And that was when you'd see the best of Theo Walcott. Um, And then obviously late on in the game, Scott Parker got sent off for a uh, second yellow just to make things worse for you guys um but interestingly i was having a look at the the league table actually after this game finished and you guys were still a good like you said seven point points ahead of us after this seven points to think that we were seven points behind spurs 
as far back as 2012 is <coughs> is quite yeah, strange. Yeah, I think, you know, when you put the banter to one side, when I said I, I felt that that was the first season that, that we were better than Arsenal in, 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 terms of, in terms of the way we were playing and the results we were putting together and 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 the way before being. I, I, I genuinely mean that. Um, but Spurs have had a lot of criticism over the years for, for bottling things. And actually, this game and this season, I think, is the one time that that can be applied fairly. Because I think we did bottle it on the day. Um, mm-hmm. There was a lot of hype about what the gap would be if we won the game. Yeah. Um, we took the lead. As soon as things started going wrong, it was a capitulation. And what happened after that game... There were other things going off off the pitch, sure, but what happened after that game was was genuinely, and it's the only time I think it, it can fairly be labelled. Tottenham, Tottenham did bottle it, yeah. and after that game, this was a significant game for Arsenal because I think after the Milan game, um, I remember you lost the first leg four 0 didn't you? Yeah. Um, and just before the next Milan game, you know, text a few of my friends as I do, and the Champions League music was on, and I said, well. I wonder when you'll hear that again. And I think that was the feeling amongst Arsenal, apart from the camaraderie that says, well, we'll finish above Tottenham, we always do. Um, if you take that to one side, you know, there's genuine concerns there. But after this game, what happened to Tottenham was, we did capitulate, we did bottle it. Our next game was Manchester United, yeah. um, which we lost. Um, and we actually, after the Arsenal game, we we only won one game in our next eight. Wow. Um, and we, we went from third on the coattails of second. Realistically, we never would have caught Manchester City or Manchester United that season. This was the Aguero season, you know, where he scored the, the famous 93rd minute goal. You know, we weren't at the level of those sides, but at one point we were hanging on to their coattails yeah. and we capitulated. And at the end of the season, Harry Redknapp was gone, and rightly so, in my opinion. Chelsea won the Champions League, and instead of Arsenal losing their spot, it was Tottenham. And that game put Tottenham back two years, in my opinion at least, um, set the foundations, ultimately, in a roundabout way for what happened today. But it kept Arsenal it kept Arsenal alive. It was significant for Arsenal at the time in a good way, but then in a bad way as well, because I think it it sort of gave Wenger a, an extra stay of execution, which obviously there was a couple of FA Cups in that period. Yeah. But you do feel that this, this, this game bought Arsenal a little bit of time. And it was the same position the next year, again, where... Arsenal were hanging on to the coattails and got out of jail. But there's only so many times you can get out of jail before actually you get it, dry, it, it dries up. But on this occasion, that game was one of the most significant North London derbies for a decade up to that point. Definitely. And the result of it was the catalyst for Tottenham capitulating. And, and Arsenal finishing third. Arsenal finishing third, which was as, as well as they could have, as high as they could have expected at that time or even, or even dreamt of, they'd have been happy. They'd have been happy drawing that game and finishing fourth at the expense of, of Chelsea. I mean, well, no one that was dreamt. The, that was the season, wasn't it, that, that Aguero won the title for City? And when you think about it, you know, we were looking at the table now. Arsenal in third were on 70 points. United and City both finished the season on 89. So that's a 19-point gap between third and second. That's incredible. But then, Yeah, it's, it's you know, huge. That, that's it. And, you know, people, you, you said that Spurs bottled it. And, and to an extent, I agree. But they only ended up finishing a point behind Arsenal and, and were very, very unfortunate not to get that Champions League spot, as much as I hate to say it. Um, but, yeah, Dan, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, really appreciate getting your point of view and your thoughts on things. Guys, if you've enjoyed this episode of A Trip Down Memory Lane, give us a like on YouTube. Uh, give us a subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, wherever you listen from, because uh, that does really help us grow. Um, so thank you very much in advance for that. And don't forget, this podcast is sponsored by Loserpool. Thanks to my guest, Dan DeLuca. Dan, do you want to quickly let our listeners or viewers know how they can follow you on social media? You're always arguing with someone, aren't you? Yeah, I'm normally just winding someone up, if I'm honest. Um, but it's DDL underscore. SSN. Um, uh, as Harry said, I join him most weeks on the Sofa Sports Pod, which he, which is currently being rebranded. So, yeah. so we'll watch this space. Soon, but, we'll be back but, very very soon. Any, anytime you want, you want me uh, back on your show, so you can all celebrate <laughs> while I while I'm in Tottenham self pity. Then, um, yeah, you're very welcome. Cheers, Dan. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me on.